I'm trying to get harder and tougher mentally and physically every day of my life. You're either the growth mindset or you're the fixed mindset. If you're trying to be the best, you need to look at who the best is and see what they do. Relentless pursuit of progress. There's a difference between the best and the rest and the rest. Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast. Champions are built in the mind first. Where we interview scientists, world champions, doctors and experts in just about every area of health and fitness. What do you care enough about? What are you fascinated enough about to go so deep and learn so much that you'll know more about it than anyone else? And now, here's your host, Michael Cashew. Michael Cashew. Welcome back. This is Michael Kaju, and you are listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. Today, I am joined by Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Lyon, like a lion, but with a Y. Dr. Lyon is a functional medicine physician specializing in muscle-centric medicine. She believes that we should stop focusing so much on body fat loss and more on muscle gain. So basically, we should stop focusing so much on the problem, just continuing to stare at the problem and start focusing more on the solution because the more muscle you have, the more metabolism you have, the easier in the end it will be for you to burn fat and to maintain results that you're looking for. And we dive deeper into protein than I've ever dove for sure on this podcast. Um, so we talk about how it relates to body composition, performance, longevity, why you need to balance your protein intake at each meal. I ask her if red meat is really bad for you or if that's just a myth. We talk about protein cycling. We go over the new vegan, um, what is it called? Not game changers. Is it game changers? I think it's game changers. The new vegan movie that everybody's all up in arms about. Uh, we talk about greenhouse gases, all kinds of fun stuff. We say some potentially offensive things on this show, so that might be exciting to you. It might not. Um, so without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Dr. Lyon, welcome. Hi. I'm stoked to be here with you today. So I obviously want to dive all into your nutritional science and protein background, um, the, your, your bread and butter, what you're talking about day in and day out. But before the show, you told me some really interesting things that I think probably say a lot about your character and a lot about how you became the person and the expert that you are today. And the first thing was that you spent 17 years in formal education, and I think it you, you had some challenges along the way. So why don't we start there? Tell us about that. Yeah. So schooling has never really been easy. It's interesting because it's something that I love. I love education. I love learning. You know, I did seven years of nutritional sciences alone, but the process of schooling the discipline, the physical discipline of having to sit and learn for so many hours was really, really hard for me. Um, did not come easy. Uh, in fact, it created a ton of anxiety. There's many times that I failed. And in fact, when I went to my fellowship, um, which I did a fellowship at Wash U in St. Louis, and that's one of the top five in the country. Um, when I got there, the residency director, she was pretty cruel. And, you know, with academic medicine, it's not this warm, friendly environment. And mm -hmm. she told me I was no better than a fourth year medical student. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a it's, you know, had done three years of family medicine, two years of psychiatry training and then was here headed for a fellowship. And that just gives you an example of the kind of um, way in which a lot of, you know, and I think it's different nowadays, a way in which a lot of medicine treats their individuals. But by the time I graduated, I graduated with some of the top grades that anyone had actually finished with. But the whole process was very demoralizing. You know, I failed a lot of tests, had to repeat a lot of stuff. And I, you know, it, it came to the point where you just have to kind of figure it out. What were some of the key insights for you? Like, what was the turning point that allowed you to go from being really challenged to being one of the top of your class? I, ha I, I made a decision. I remember sitting in, I was studying for one of the step exams and 
I was just sitting in this big room. All I had was a desk. It's very easy to get distracted. Nothing, nothing around and note cards. And on those note cards, you know, I had just put, you know, two or three sentences that reminded me it had nothing to do with the external environment. Everything that was happening was all internal. No matter what anyone said, no matter how I was treated, no matter what I was told, no matter how many times I was belittled, it didn't matter. And I just read these cards over and over again as I sat there. And the biggest thing I had to overcome was the voice inside, Mm -hmm. right? Telling me that I couldn't do it or I wasn't worthy of it. And uh, yeah, that was the the biggest thing. So let me get this. Let me see if I have this straight. So your insight was that your internal environment, how you feel about yourself was and still is up to you and you don't have to be affected by what other people say by external stimuli? Yeah, exactly, right? So failure or success is totally an inside job. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. I mean, you know, medicine is not warm and fuzzy. And if an individual is going to a warm and fuzzy environment, you don't want them as your doctor. Mm -hmm. That is just not how it goes. You know, and it comes a point where that extern, no matter what's being said on the outside, you decide. Mm-hmm. And, and that really was my experience because I'm a, you know, a female physician in a, you know, at that time was more of a male dominated experience. Right. right. And, uh, it was tough, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think not many listeners can relate to med school specifically, but it's a, an audience of very growth minded driven people. And I know from experience that when I'm living on my edge, when I'm really going for it, that inner self critic, it just gets louder and louder and louder. The more risk I'm taking, the louder that can be. And I've had that insight over and over and over. Um, it oftentimes comes after I've caused myself a lot of pain and suffering yeah. because I forget that lesson. Totally. So for you, what, yeah, tell me more. What was on those cards? What was it that had an impact? I remember, on you? you know, that was, a, you know, I wish I could remember the exact sayings, but it was, you know, you had mentioned something before. Uh, it was actually how I found Mark Devine. Mm-hmm. So you were going to ask me about Kokoro. And for those that don't know, Mark Devine is, you know, runs SEAL Fit, Unbeatable Mind, and he's a commander, former commander, Navy SEAL. And um, I knew that there was a period of time where my mindset had to shift. And that's actually how I found Mark. Because it just, what I was doing, how I was thinking was incorrect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I wish I I remembered what was on those cards, but. I think, uh, Something interesting is that it it probably doesn't matter so much what is on the cards as much as simply like noticing and becoming aware that whatever someone just said to you or whatever stream of thought or consciousness is going on in your brain right now, when you can just snap yourself out of that, it doesn't matter if it's, hey, I love you. Gabby or, Hey, I love you, Michael, or, Hey, you're killing it or you're, you know, whatever it is. I think for me, it's noticing when I'm in some kind of negative spiral, right? If if I I notice that I'm caught in some uh, negative loop or something like that. Yeah. And, And I think that that's really helpful. The other aspect, the other side to that is welcoming it. So instead of trying to run from it, which for a period of time, I was like, Oh no, I'm going to do all these things so that you can like me and I can do it right. And I can do a good job. I was just like, no, negative Houston. Mm -hmm. It's about, come on, bring it. You've got something to say. You want some criticism. I cannot wait for it. It's going to make me better. Come Mm -hmm. on. You know, so there'd be periods of time where you're up for 24 hours every third day, you're up for 24 hours. It was like the harder it got and you're responsible for people's lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're literally responsible. It, it, it ends up on you. You know, everyone's like, oh, you're just a resident or, oh, you're just a fellow. I am sorry. That is not how that goes. There are individuals whose lives you are responsible for, Mm -hmm. truly. And, uh, you know, you are definitely sleep deprived. You're in an environment where it is not healthy, mentally healthy or physically healthy. And uh, you're criticized and scrutinized. And there was that period of time where that was a negative for me. Mm -hmm. And once that no longer was a negative, then I was able to excel. I was able to excel at 
the clinical research I was doing, I was able to excel at the clinics I was running. And it's so interesting because it's the same situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it's kind of like the seals that I take care of. You know, we had talked about earlier, my husband's a seal and, you know, you've got two people standing, getting ready to jump out of a plane and you have one guy and his heart's racing and his blood pressure is, you know, like even, and he's like, let's do this. I can't wait. Same situation. You have the other guy next to you and he is terrified. His heart's he's got some shit in his pants. <laughs> right, totally, literally. I am <laughs> certain of it. Right. So you've got the same situation, exact same situation, same stimulus. And literally two extraordinarily different experiences. Mm -hmm. And so that that's, you know, as I think about the story and I paint the picture, that's how it was for me in, you know, two residencies and a fellowship. Mm -hmm. It's brutal. But then you switch it and then you become exceptional. And that's an, an ongoing process. And it's, you know, that you don't stop. You don't stop it at learning. You're constantly growing. And you're not only growing academically, but you're growing internally. Powerful. So you spent a lot of time in geriatrics, I think in the more of the beginning of your career. The um, end, actually. The oh, end. the end of, oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. what was it like experiencing, and I'm using your own words here, what was it like experiencing so much death and what? how has that impacted you even today, if at all? Yeah, I actually think I have some PTSD from it, which I think a lot of doctors don't talk about. So part of the deal was I was going to do a nutritional science fellowship at WashU in a very famous scientist lab. And in order, me to do, in order for me to do that, the deal was I was also going to have to do geriatrics. For people who don't know geriatrics, it's over the age of 65, but really they call you the death fairy. So it's the later on, it's the end of life. You're also doing palliative care. You're literally at the bedside of dying individuals mm -hmm. and you could run in through 30 a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like outrageous. There's definitely a certain amount of PTSD that I think a lot of individuals, maybe they don't experience, but I did. So I was very into optimization and pro-life. I had never thought about death and dying. Mm -hmm. So 50% of my time was spent at the bedside of dying individuals. Mm -hmm all the regret, all that I wish I could have. Wow. I mean, you know, person after person, can you imagine? You know, and then as you watch their lives unfold and their stories and it's, it's as if, I mean, there's no, there's no coming back. Mm -hmm. So it, it did a few things to me. And number one, it probably made me the most paranoid person on the planet. Aside from my husband, mm -hmm. um, no, no kidding. But it, it really made me experience the fragility of life. It is nobody gets out alive. Nobody escapes, right? It is inevitable that it will happen to every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And that end looks different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that seeing death so many times so close really makes you think about how fleeting everything is. So that, that's one part. It's kind of the, the dark, I feel depressed, I'm gonna go cry in a closet now. Mm -hmm. And then there's the lighter side. And that side is, man, every second counts. What are we gonna do to make it happen? Right. How are you gonna optimize your body, right? So every workout you miss, that's it, that day's gone. And there's going to be time when you're 85 years old going, man, I wish I was doing that sprint interval where I vomited, but I, I missed that day because I didn't feel like it, mm -hmm. you know? So what we do midlife really alters the trajectory of how we age. So those were two really important experiences that, that came from that. And, you know, that death never escapes me. It is always something that, you know, I'm thinking about or, or seeing. So it's, it's tough. Yeah. And it can have one of two effects. It can really depress you and make you worried about the, your looming death, or it can have a, such a positive grounding effect of making yes. you appreciate what you have now. And like you're saying, really take care of this meat suit that we're in and mm -hmm. we're going to inhabit until the day that we die so that we have a higher quality of life for longer. 
Yes. And that inspires me. So I'm very outspoken and we, you know, we touch on this. I'm very outspoken when it comes to protein, aging and muscle. And I'm outspoken because I, I've seen it. So everyone can argue, oh, be vegan, be vegetarian. And all of these people that are, you know, like the mouse with the microphone, they haven't sat at the bedside of dying individuals that had fallen and broken a hip. And now they're at the end of their life Mm because they couldn't support themselves physically. The conversation is totally different. Right. So whereas the sphere of you know, I'm in the paleo world and I'm going to argue about this, or I'm in the vegan world and I'm going to argue about this. Uh, I'm sorry that that's all great in theory. And you can be in your mid forties or fifties. And, you know, I mean, I definitely get a lot of hate from some of these doctors, Mm -hmm. but I mean, they have not seen, or they're not geriatricians. They have no idea. Right. Mm -hmm. So the argument becomes very small because nobody that has ever taken care of an aging parent or a grandparent is going to say, eat more plants and less protein. And that's the way it's going to go for you. Not one. So it, it, it really inspires me to be truthful with the information that I have and to be as outspoken as I can. So as many people hear it as possible. So most of the listeners of the show are between the ages of 24 and 44 based on our our metrics and so and that and i'm included in that we all we have we have parents we have grandparents aunts and uncles that we want to live the highest quality life for as long as possible from all of your experience what are what are one two or three of the most impactful things you think we should be nudging them towards they have to get high quality protein if it's living and you have to kill it, or if it's gravity bearing, it's running, flying, or swimming, mm-hmm. you have to feed your, you have to encourage them to eat that. Over the age of 70, the average protein consumption is 66 grams. In order for them to even maintain the muscle tissue, so muscle is not just this thing that we think about for CrossFit or exercise, it's the largest organ in the body, and it's your metabolic currency. So it will protect you from diabetes because it's responsible for a large amount of glucose metabolism. It will protect you from high cholesterol. It's a large site of fatty acid oxidation. The, uh, there are metabolic components that make muscle the organ of longevity. Mm. There is a traje- trajectory of aging that happens for our parents, our grandparents, our older brother, that once you hit about 40, you know, you start, you know, between 40 and 50, this of course depends on your activity and hormonal status, but the tissue changes. And as that tissue changes, if you eat the way you did in your twenties, which is maybe you don't need enough protein and you're really physically active. If you don't actually increase your protein, high quality protein as you age, that tissue becomes much harder to maintain. So number one, the most important thing that you can tell the people that you love who are getting older, right, is increase their quality of protein and it has to be at least 30 grams per meal throughout the day. So if they're having three meals a day, I mean, my dad eats 50 grams of protein per sitting. Mm -hmm. He gets 150 grams a day. And that's how he rolls. He's 70. The guy is like an ox. So, you know, and even to go a little further, uh, I think you recommend one gram per pound of body weight, right? I do. And you can go up on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really can go up. There's, there's never been a negative protein study, no matter what you quote here. Um, when, what do you mean by that? There's never been a negative study. Oh, reduce your red meat. Um, Protein is linked to cancer. Protein is linked to heart disease. None of this is high quality evidence. So in fact, it's observational epidemiological data, which no healthcare professional would ever make a recommendation on. In fact, if we were talking about turnips, nobody would care. But there is agenda behind the message Mm -hmm. of eat less protein and eat more plants. It's agenda driven. Mm -hmm. It is 100% not evidence based, not high quality. Let me say that. 
it's it's there's quote evidence it's very low quality evidence uh, whereas on the flip side you have randomized control trials multiple like even the dash diet or the mediterranean diet that are higher protein which are all randomized control trials that show the benefit so it's unfortunate that we live in an environment now where there's a lot of misinformation that's driven by big money. And that's really what we're seeing. So why are the studies promoting lower protein diets, vegan diets, et cetera? Why are they low quality? The, well, the studies are low quality because their observation are epidemiologic. So usually it's based on something called a food frequency questionnaire. So 10 years ago, tell me how much protein you ate. Mm. I don't know what I ate yesterday. Exactly. Me neither. I mean, I don't even remember last time I slept. So it's, it's impossible. And it, you know, it doesn't account for, did you smoke? Do you live in a polluted area? Are you eating a cheeseburger? I don't know. I mean, they're not well controlled. You cannot make massive health recommendations based on low quality evidence. Mm-hmm. It's unethical. But you have groups that at the heart of it all is they're against killing animals. Mm-hmm. And I can appreciate that. And, but that's a whole other topic of conversation rather than saying, so, so make it about that. So if you're against animal cruelty and killing animals, please make it about that. Rather but don't than protein say, is bad. Yeah, right. Because it's hurting people. So that message is creating and adding to an aging population. Mm-hmm. It is devastating. The consequences are devastating. I am a practicing physician. So I am not a physician on the internet. I am not just a, um, I read it in a book and now I'm teaching it to you. I see patients in my clinic and the results are devastating. So don't do it. And people have to filter out the BS. One more thing I I noticed you say was hormonal status. I can't help but think of us changing our hormonal status on Facebook in the future. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. It's so funny, you know. Um, of course, optimizing testosterone and optimizing hormones are essential. Mm-hmm. Um, so protein is, is individual's agent, and protein even in your demographic, right? It's key. Get your protein right. Everything else kind of falls into place. You have a very athletic community. They have to earn their carbohydrates. Right. But I will tell you this. Um, for every 100 grams of protein you eat, you make 60 grams of carbohydrates through gluconeogenesis in the body. Break that down a little bit for us. So a lot of individuals, you'll you'll see in, you know, I take care of a lot of athletes and a lot of them feel that they need to have a higher carbohydrate intake Mm -hmm. for performance. Um, It depends on the athlete and it depends on their volume. You know, like the seals going out on deployments, it's, they they do need carbohydrates because just the amount of weight that they're carrying, you're talking about ops that are, You know, they're going out for long 10, 20 hours. It's not, you know, it's kind of, they they need fuel. But for everybody else, um, so if you have 100 grams of protein, 60 grams of that protein will get converted to glucose just in your body. So for me and my athletes, they, I start them at a very low carbohydrate. They earn it all. I mean, I don't go above 90 and I take care of um, an Indy 500 racer. He's, uh, he won the Indy 500 and, um, people would think that that's not an athletic event. It absolutely is. Yeah. Those dudes are at it for hours. For hours. You know, and they've got vector force and they have things that are, they're having to stabilize. It's, it's a different idea of training, but it is, it is high intensity. They're very physical. They're training when they're not in the car and then training in the car. Oh, I don't doubt it. Look, I, I've been in a, one of those Tesla SUVs and someone went like zero to 60 like that. That was like a mini workout. And these guys are going so much faster. They're going around turns. They're near death. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so you, so you get the protein right and you earn your carbohydrates and you train hard. And you keep training hard and you figure out how not to get injured. And if you get injured, you figure out how to fix it. 
And those are the things, you know, that I see, you know, as individuals age, even as they've been athletes their whole life, they might have a shoulder that then hurts and then they limit what they're doing in their shoulder. Ah, you know, I have this rotator cuff injury. Mm -hmm. Fix it. If you can find alternative ways, there's stem cell, there's PRP, there's uh, all kinds of alternative ways to repair and replenish. You know, so th that would be the three top things, you know, don't continue to, to limit your ability to move. Mm, I love that. How important is strength training versus just moving for these populations? Things like yoga, walking, biking. How important it is any. to, what's that? I don't count any of that. Okay. Yeah. How, how important is resistance training, strength training? Yeah. So that's, um, you know, it's those muscles, it's those fiber types that go first. If also, if you have hypothyroidism, so you'll see that individuals with hypothyroidism have a hard time, uh, with metabolism and putting on muscle. Um, so as individuals age, strength training is really key. And, you know, it's the key to longevity in general. So if someone comes into my clinic and tells me they do yoga and they walk and they bike, I'm like, okay, so tell me what you're doing for exercise. There's a certain amount of stimulus mm -hmm. and pain required for it to be effective. At least that's what I believe. So to break it down even further, why is it important? So strength training or is stimulating we'll just call them fast twitch muscle fibers to keep it very simple. Why is it important for athletes or not athletes for aging populations to maintain fast twitch, their the strongest motor units in their body yeah. versus their, you know, the slower twitch. So I, I love this question because it's not just about the athletes. So anyone who is obese or has low grade inflammation. So people that are maybe new to CrossFit or new to training and have low grade inflammation, those muscle tissues are affected and resistance training. When you contract the muscle against resistance actually secretes something called myokines. And these go then, so these are proteins and uh, proteins that go throughout the body that lower, actually lower inflammation mm -hmm. and have multiple effects on the tissue. So, I mean, strength training, you have to maintain those fibers. You also maintain your metabolism by doing that. Gotcha. And is that because they are bigger and require yeah. more energy? Yes. Yes, sir. That is, that is right. Love it. So you believe that we should focus on more on building muscle than reducing body fat. Everybody talks about getting lean and, and right. they do their body fat test. No one talks about lean muscle mass. Right. So, right. It's this, this, I say this a lot we're focusing on the problem, which is over fat. That's what everyone thinks the problem is over fat, mm -hmm. but it's really about under muscle. People are not over fat. They're under muscled because if you have, you know, an ox of a guy who is lean and ripped, you know, I mean, these metabolic processes are so much more effective and efficient than, mm -hmm. you know, being over fat. You, you don't want to focus on losing quote weight. You want to build muscle, which then burns excess body fat. I kind of think about it and, and correct me if my thinking is wrong. Like the more like metabolism is like a fire and the more muscle, the more logs you're putting on that fire. So then when you're just sitting around, like the more you work out, the more muscle you build, when you're just sitting around at the house, this fire is just roaring and your metabolism is high and you're able to burn fat without even doing anything at that point. So I'm going to go hit the squat rack and then I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so really it's, it's your metabolic currency. It's mm -hmm. what you need. And then, you know, as you age and when I say age, like I said, I'm talking about forties, it becomes more challenging, right? So you go through this growth period and you kind of have a peak and the better an athlete you can be and the more training you can do, you know, in the smart way, I don't want to say volume training because, you know, I've done that and, ripped everything but you know the the better athlete you can be when you're young and you're hitting your peak is really helpful as you age got it you know we have to think you know your your listeners right now have the capacity to really think long term you know what do they need to do now because it's really easy to be a hard charger now mm -hmm. so if they can do it smartly then their trajectory of always being athletic is going to be there. Got it. So this 
my audience probably doesn't have a problem getting enough protein. Um, so let's dive into some of more of the nuances within protein. So you're also a big proponent about balancing your protein intake across your meals throughout the day. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that and why that's important? So the whole idea of where I came, where I came up with the 30 grams when I said earlier is they need at least 30 grams is you have protein is determined. The quality of protein is determined really by the indispensable amino acids. And those are the, the essential amino acids that you need. And of those indispensable amino acids, there are the branch chain amino acids. I'm sure everyone's heard of that in particular leucine. Leucine is the amino acid that arguably is most important for muscle health and body composition. Now that leuc now leucine needs to be at about two and a half grams per meal to trigger muscle protein synthesis. And I'm going to translate this all for the, the, the listener. So two and a half grams of leucine equals about 30 grams of protein. So that's between four and five ounces of, say, a steak mm -hmm. or chicken. So you need that to stimulate this process of muscle protein synthesis. And is that the same in everyone? It is the same in everyone because it's based on blood volume. Yes, that's a great question. It is the same with no, if you have a 120 pound female and a 200 pound male, you still need a minimum of 30 grams because it's based on the amino acid level in the blood. And that's actually a very important point. Now, when you're young, you have a very robust response. So the key with leucine, this amino acid, one of the branch chains that then stimulates muscle protein synthesis, which is um, really, it's a, it's an mTOR, you know, you've heard mTOR, so it stimulates mTOR. Um, when you're young, you can get away with maybe 1.8 grams of leucine. But then when you age, your body goes through this process of anabolic resistance. So you actually need more protein to get the same effect that you did when you were younger. So your body is resisting gaining muscle. Yes. And it's resistant to the protein, the mechanism that protein stimulates. Got it. So you actually need more. So really, if you are over the age of 35 and you wanted to optimize yourself, I would say hit 40 grams of protein. You cannot go wrong. And you distribute it throughout the day so that the machinery starts and then it can reset and then it starts again and then it resets. And there's many different ways to do it and people can play with it, but I definitely wouldn't recommend going below 40 grams of protein. Got it. So like what happens if someone is fasting until noon, then they're eating a salad with like only a little bit of meat, maybe 20 grams of protein, and then they're yeah. eating 150 grams of protein at night. What, what, what is going to happen to them over time? So they'll get what we call skinny fat. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. So some individuals will say it's the total amount of protein per day that matters. So they're getting 100 and 120 grams of protein at one meal they are getting all they need. They might be getting, quote, all they need, but you're not doing it in a way that optimizes body composition. You know, there is a threshold for um, effectiveness. So you absorb all of it. So you'll absorb that 100 grams. But really, you only require probably around 50 to max out the engine. So now that other 50 is totally gone to waste as it relates to muscle. So that's not a great strategy. And over time, you can definitely lose muscle tissue that way. Got it. Well, I'm not going to be doing any of that. So what's up with red meat? You, you mentioned red meat earlier, yeah. and I think there are a ton of myths about it. What, uh, what, what's the deal? Red meat is the OG of superfoods. That's I mean, it's great, great to hear. I mean, that's, like, <laughs> that's great to hear. And that's it. So red meat is really one of the superfoods. You have iron, you have B12, zinc, selenium. I mean, there's ne they've never proven that there's an issue with it. Mm -hmm. Every And I think that, you know, they, they had the annals of internal medicine release those four studies, their analysis that said that we don't need to cut back on eating red meat. You don't. And this is, I don't know if you've seen it, it's been a pretty big... You know, it's gotten a lot of pushback. They tried to discredit the scientists who who put this out, and and the scientists didn't care what the answer was. So this, so there was a group that 
they got together and they looked at all the data. I think it was about 4 million people. And they, they wanted to see if actually red meat was bad for you and if we really needed to further reduce it. What they found is they, they couldn't find any strong evidence that linked red meat to chronic diseases. And they published these studies, which was a really big deal. It's probably the biggest news in nutrition in the last 20 years. And um, in fact, it was so impactful that they went after the scientists. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just turns out that these groups that were saying to reduce the meat uh, were making massive health recommendations based on very low quality evidence. So, yeah, t tell us a little bit more about that. Like, wh what's going on? Why are so many uh, newspapers and articles online talking about how bad red meat is for you? Why are, why are even, even doctors, a lot of doctors recommending it? What's, what's going on behind the scenes that's making this happen? It's really interesting. So the doctors have no idea. They are, you know, I, I got this journal from one of the medical journals talking about how protein increases cancer risk in, in prostate cancer. And then you look at the evidence and it's horrible evidence. So the doctors are being fed misinformation and the people, there's, there's, a, there's no money in commodities, right? So a commodity would be beef, egg, pork. They're farmers, right? There's no money in that. But if someone says eat impossible burger or beyond whatever, what is it? Beyond meat, impossible burger, whatever, mm -hmm. there is a ton of money and there's a ton of money behind it and they're governed by two different bodies. So the commodities are USDA. They have their hands tied and they can, they can never make a negative claim, right? They're very tightly regulated. They cannot say, um, butter is better for you than margarine. And then on the other side, you have the FDA and the Federal Trade Commission that, you know, governs like Quaker Oats and, and processed foods. They actually can say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. As long as they don't claim that they cure disease, they can say beef is terrible for you. Beef causes this. They can say whatever they want. So you've got two food groups. One is like a Franken food and the other one is a whole food which is agriculture and are governed by a different body and can't say anything. So, you know, at the, at the underbelly of it all is number one money and maybe not in this order. And two protein is very emotional for people. Mm -hmm. It has a face, you know, there's never been any studies that have really held up. They tried to say saturated fat was, you know, um, you have to cut out meat because of saturated fat. And then, None of the studies showed that. Once controlled for calories, there was no issue. And in fact, 51% of the fat, the, the fat in beef is monounsaturated. It's olive oil. Right? So you take that off the table. Then you get the um, environmental argument. And that's not true. Right? So agriculture in the U.S. accounts for 9% of any kind of greenhouse gas. Of that 9%, 3.5% is, is cattle and dairy. So if... if eating red meat is killing the environment. If you killed and wiped out all the cows, you would effectively be changing greenhouse gas in the U.S. by 3.5%. Tell me how that makes any sense. If you really want to help, you will reduce travel. You won't eat avocados from Mexico. You know, it's really mm -hmm. industry, electricity, and, and transportation. Mm -hmm. So those, you know, and then, so the individuals, and again, like I said, it's money and then it's animal welfare. So then they try to make it about something else, like protein causes cancer. That's never been proven. Mm -hmm. We don't even know where that came from. Like, you know, maybe excess calories, excess insulin, excess estrogens, you know, those things are oncogenic. Right. But there's never been a relationship. Right. And it's, it's a lot of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to believe that it, almost always, if not always starts with some very caring person, right? They want to make a difference. They see, they see animals being treated poorly in these huge feedlots. They want to make a difference. And so they think making a vegan bar or an impossible burger will have some sort of positive effect. I think, I think a lot of people are in their hearts are in the right place. And then 
they have a business, they have bills right. and overhead to pay, and they're human and they want to make money and they want the, you know freedom. And so they start finding all of the ways possible they can right. to create a narrative that supports their cause. And so that's when we start hearing things like protein is bad, red meat, red meat kills you, et cetera. Am I on the right path? You are 100% right. And it's, it's a shame because it's better to be transparent and say, listen, I don't think that people should eat meat because it's mean. Okay. You know, we have been eating meat for 2.5 million years, but okay. Right? Like, okay. But then when you start to say animal and plant protein are the same, that you don't need animals, then you start affecting my parents mm -hmm. and their grandparents and your family and you deteriorate their health, and that's not okay. So keep opinions and your emotions on one side and be open with it, have your heart on sleep, do whatever you want, but don't bring your BS to the rest of the world and say that these are the health, quote health reasons why you should be doing these things, because that is not accurate. Mm -hmm. I, was on, I was on national television with five plant-based physicians and myself, and I literally, oh they would say, it was just, it, it hasn't come out yet. I, I can't really talk too much about it, but um, I could say the sky is blue and they would say, no, 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 it's green. They say cattle is, you know, we're eating too much meat and it's killing the environment. And I'm like, well, but uh, if that's the case, then, ag but agriculture is only 9% of greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. How is that the cow's fault? And the cows are living on lands that can only be used to roam cattle, you can't grow broccoli in North Dakota or Montana. I mean, that's cattle land. I mean, that's what, so they were making, and they would say, no, no, you're not, that's not right. And uh, did you see the movie Game Changers? Which is, by the way, terrible. I mean, I can't even think anyone that even watched that and was like, oh yeah, this is good or relevant. It's not. Actually, probably, I I'm finding out more and more, like, a surprising number of people. I was in a CrossFit gym today and there were like half of the people had watched it. A couple people are like trying a vegan diet. I mean, that it was just such a joke. I, I did not even find it compelling. You know, none of they don't even tell you vegan, vegetarian, are they, are they eating fish or eggs? We have no idea. Mm -hmm. They just say, well, plant-based. Well, the American diet is actually, I hate to break it to everyone, plant-based. It's 70% plants already. We're already doing plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. They didn't have one. They have no science. They just made that. They just made it up. I mean, the stuff that they were saying, they just made it up. And almost none of those athletes were, you know, they built their career on proteins that were living. were not plants, you know, either fish, chicken. We don't know. Drugs. I mean, some of those guys aren't drug free. OK, yeah, you can eat a bunch of plants and take a bunch of drugs. Mm -hmm. OK. Most of them had the worst career, uh, worst seasons of their life, went on to retire. You know, I mean, certain diets work well for certain people. It's fine. But to, to make a propaganda film and say that that is, quote, healthy, I mean, it's such a joke. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I mean, you mean to tell me in your heart, people really believe that the protein in plants is the same as protein in animals. How does that make any sense? Muscle feeds muscle. Plant feeds plant. Like, it's... I mean, people just have to like rip the veil away. Yeah. I mean, it's so obvious. Yeah, it's just great. It's great marketing and propaganda. And yeah. I, w I want to be clear, like I'm a huge proponent of um, people moving away from eating so much meat that comes from these massive food lots and eating more free range and regenerative agriculture animals. I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, and I firmly believe that, that we need to eat meat as humans. And choose what you want. And if that really works for you and you feel amazing doing it, then, um, who are we to argue? Yeah. And you know, listen, everyone has their own experience and their belief and that is fine. You know, and I have seen uh, more vegetarian diets work better for some people. So everyone should experiment. But when we get into trouble is when people are really zealots about stuff and then they're making claims that aren't true and they're being really dishonest and it's, creates this atmosphere of chaos and confusion for people. And that's dangerous. You know, my goal is to be a voice of reason. I trained for a long time. I, you know, 
my background is I actually trained with one of the world leading protein experts. Um, and he's still a mentor of mine today. So tell me about protein cycling and meatless Mondays. Great. I'd love to tell you about that. Let's say we do meatless Mondays. Guess what percentage you are going to be that people will be able to have on the environment. Meatless Monday. I'm not even gonna let you guess 1.5%. So tell me, t t back up. So what, is what, is meat, what is meatless Monday? So everyone thinks that they're going to make an impact on the, on the greenhouse gas by reducing uh, meatless Monday by reducing meat. It's called gotcha. meatless Monday. So I just want to sh share with you the statistic of, of what percent individuals are actually making an impact. Mm -hmm. You'll, you'll impact greenhouse gas by maybe 1.5%. Maybe Matt, maybe. I mean, 1.5%, that's, that's better than nothing. However, what's like, okay. I, I feel like a better argument is if you take one less flight per year, it's like doing meatless every day, right? Like, a, like that's, taking that's one less the, flight is so much more impactful on greenhouse gases. I mean, I don't know the number, but that would make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that at some point you don't, it doesn't make sense to sacrifice your health and well-being by saying, you know, if you do a meatless Monday and you, the the best that you could ever do would be to affect greenhouse gas by 1.5%. That's not, I would find other ways to do it. Like don't waste food, travel less, eat locally, mm -hmm. but don't sacrifice your health because you sacrifice your health. Someone like me is going to have to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there's a trade off. You know, you can't just decide you're going to have a cheat day and eat a whole bunch of carbs one day. It's, it's not effective for anybody. You know, I think what you said is much more valuable. Take, a, take one less flight. You know, people are, it's very confusing for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one really resonates with me because we fly a ton and we love, you know, we love to travel. We're going to see family and, and see these business events and yet reducing our footprint is valuable so that's definitely something we're considering i know that plane plane rides are like the biggest contributor they're a huge so plane so transportation industry and and electrical make mm -hmm. up 80 percent of greenhouse gas contra, uh, contributing from america 80 percent. so, so that's right. where that's where we make the real difference right but why but why are people saying you don't hear anyone saying that you hear nobody say take one less flight but you do hear them say, oh, have a meatless Monday. Mm -hmm. it makes no sense. You see that just even the conversation is confused. It's like skewed for people. Mm -hmm. Well, once someone creates a company around uh, organizing a tribe of people taking one last flight and they can make money doing it, then, then we <laughs> might start hearing it. <laughs> right. But I mean, you make a really good point and there are other ways to affect the environment. And that is, you know, don't waste your food, right? All that waste has to be disposed of, mm -hmm. right? That affects the environment. Um, it decays. Don't eat, you know, like there's an area in California that makes 50% of all the produce mm -hmm. that all gets flown in. Yeah. I don't know if it's 50%, but it's. There's an area in California that is where most of the produce comes from and we're getting it shipped. Right. You know, and that's, that's a lot, you right. know, if you can't eat it locally, then maybe you shouldn't be eating it. And if it's not in season for you, then maybe you shouldn't be eating pineapples from Hawaii. Man, you're, you're challenging us now. Personal Man. choices. Yep. Let's talk about your work with the SEAL teams. So I've, I saw somewhere you say something like one of the most impactful things that you've done with them is simply to reduce their caffeine intake. Oh talk, my to, God. talk to us about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I'll never forget. I was uh, I had a, a SEAL in. He'd been in for 20 years I'm trying to think of how to, you know, how much I can say about him. He's literally a tree trunk. So he's a, a breacher. So he's the guy that goes in with all the explosives, about 260 pounds and uh, sitting in my office, so calm. I'm like, you know, how you doing? I'm good. Take his blood pressure. It's a little elevated. It's like 130 over 80, but he's a big dude. Go to feel his pulse. And this guy is so calm. 
his pulse was like 130 beats per minute. Jesus. He was tacking away. And I'm like, hey, you know, did you drink coffee? He's like, yeah, you know, I have, a, a, I have three cups. I'm like, how big are your cups? And he's like, I don't know, they're 24 ounces. Oh, man. I mean, all of them. Wow. And, but, you know, my husband's a seal, so, I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. These guys are, it was, it's outrageous. So, you know, one of the things, one of the things that we work, and we work on a lot. So I do a lot of environmental um, toxicity with them and a lot of uh, infectious disease. When they go on deployments, they, a lot of them come back with whipworm, schistomoniasis, you know, whatever <laughs> from eating and, and, and being in the, in the waters. But really when they come back, it's all about resetting their nervous system making sure their hormones are optimized and then reducing all the stimulants that maybe they're used to taking like coffee. And why is that important? That is not a way to maintain any kind of longevity. You know, it's not good for the heart. It's not good for the body. It's not good for the nervous system. Um, it affects sleep. You know, there's a lot of nicotine use, a lot of nicotine gum use, which, mm -hmm. you know, for a small amount, it's not bad. You know, it's great for appetite. It, it, it's great for stimulation, for neurocognitive function. But what happens is, is you become very um, desensitized to these things. And then the amount that you have to ingest to get the same effect becomes higher and higher. You know, and, you know, I look at it from the standpoint of these guys are my friends, you know, my husband's friends. And it, you, know, you worry about, you know, again, that goes back to the geriatric fellowship that I did. You know, I've seen the end of life. You know, I've seen veterans at the end of their life, I, you just think about how the ending can be different and the choices that you make in the middle affect that ending. Mm -hmm. So what effects have you seen it have on people removing caffeine? A lot of people with chronic anxiety get better. That's um, a powerful one. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So the chronic anxiety gets better mm. and the, the, the sleep issues really improve and, and people don't realize how sensitive they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that they become much more effective. You think that you need the stimulant to be effective, but actually if you reduce it and then maybe you have it for a special occasion, maybe like a big workout, you'll find that it, then you really are, are utilizing it smartly. Right. Obviously. That is super interesting that you say that. I have a love-hate relationship with caffeine and have had it for a long time. Um, I, fi 